Hello. Um, I have two different things that I just wanted to talk about in a short reflection video. Um, one is that uh, earlier this week, um, the actors at the uh, conservatory that I'm a part of met with the kind of like leadership of the theater that we work for, uh, the Oslo Rep Theater. And we had this really interesting conversation where there was so much formal language that was being talked about, right? And, and um, so to kind of give you a little context for the last year or so, there has been a lot of unrest with, um, after the George Floyd murder uh, happened, there was a call to action to call um, the people who are in power uh, to account for the lack of diversity that is at the theater that is at the Oslo Rep, um, you know, the lack of diversity and inclusion. And there has just been generally a, a major disconnect between the powers that be and the people who don't have power uh, and the people who have a lot of work and are um, occupied with, you know, the work or schoolwork or, or whatever. And this was, this meeting earlier this week was centered on bridging the divide between the rep and the conservatory. And I just wanted to note how important I think it is for there to be informal hangout kind of communication and socializing in institutions. What does that mean, right? That sounds so abstract. What institutions and organizations, schools, um, any kind of professional organization, what a lot of those organizations focus on is formal interactions, right? Formal communication, right? Formal emails. There's a certain kind of standard of etiquette that you go into organizations with, right? Like when you go and interview for a job, you want to kind of play the part of a professional. You want to make sure that you come off as hardworking and reliable and efficient, uh, adaptable, productive. There, that, there is that role that is, that is played. As people get more and more into their jobs, into their culture of their work environment, they people tend to develop, I think this is what it means like to be, to be grown up or to have a real person job, right? People tend to develop a certain theoretical or abstract language that is sterilized, that doesn't really get kind of get to the points of issues. I think this is a major issue with politics as well. And what I think needs to happen is kind of a relaxing of that and, and a need to get heart, just like the need to view people as people, not as obstacles or as people who work for you or as objects. Um, and, and I think that a lot of like business meetings or formal emails tend to develop and evolve language into this spot of sterilization and also distance from one another. I think that's what it gets down to, is that organizations and institutions and how we run meetings and everything these days, it it has developed a culture of distancing each other, distancing each other. We distance ourselves from each other using that language. And that kind of development of language just makes people very fucking tired of talking to anyone because it, because what talking to people is through that kind of lens, through a, a work lens, through professional lens is not human at all. It's transactional. What can you give to me 
and what can I give to you? And how do we politely navigate around each other? How do we walk on eggshells to be able to get what we want? How do we get what we want without causing a stir, right? Because no one likes conflict. So how can I get what I want from you without causing a conflict? We enter into this dialogue, this professional dialogue together, and we get what we want, right? Through, through interactions. And that's, that, that, I mean, that it works, it works, it's functional, but it's not optimal. What is optimal is talking to people as human beings and talking about what is lacking in the institution. Now, how do we get there? How do we get to a place where we can talk about things directly and not feel uncomfortable while talking about the things that we want, the things that we need, the things that we can see can really improve where we are, our industries, our businesses, and not feel like we're gonna be penalized for saying the wrong things to our bosses, right? Like I just talked to this guy, Bryson, he works at McDonald's and he works with people who annoy him sometimes, he said. So how can we get to a place where we feel like Bryson would feel comfortable going to his boss and being like, look, these people are being annoying and I don't wanna hang out with them. You know, I don't wanna, they're, they're not creating a helpful environment, right? And I, I think that that active flow of communication, that vulnerability needs to be it, that the allowance of vulnerability in the workplace and anywhere else in the world is how we grow, is how we achieve a sufficient and optimal level of productivity and also happiness, feeling like we're worth something. My question is, how do we get there? First of all, leadership needs to be proactive in seeking out how people under them, people who don't have as much power, the people in power need to search out those people who aren't in power and ask their opinions, ask what's going on with them and how they can improve, how, how they think the collective can improve on the culture that they're a part of. Um, and this, this, I mean, th this language right now itself is pretty formal, right? But, and there's, there's a point to it, right? Formal language provides structure and informal language provides heart. So it's important because formal structure allows for things to develop in a sustainable way. It provides the framework for things to move forward without, while people change roles and leadership changes. But leadership, the way to get heart into a community, and this is what I'm talking about. This is community values. This is what I'm talking about. Community values is the thesis of this video. To develop a, to, develop community values, leadership needs to be proactive in reaching out to people and asking their opinions and asking people how they feel and how things can improve. That's what needs to happen. That's not happening at Oslo Rep. And it's not happening in politics. It's happening some, some places, you know, I think a lot of people view Donald Trump as a person who was of the people, who was fighting for the people, and that's why he was so popular. I think Bernie Sanders has a similar appeal. You know, Bernie Sanders has been out uh, picketing with people for years. He, you know, he has a grassroots movement. That's what it means to be a populist, I think, is, is that there are those populist leaders, Trump, Bernie, are are viewed as fighting for the people, are viewed as providing heart in a, in a structural kind of atmosphere. Right now, we are living in a structural atmosphere, in a professional atmosphere, and people are tired of it because people realize, people realize that 
they are viewed as just objects and not as human beings, right? We need to prioritize being human beings. Which brings me to my next point, talking about the difference between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. There have been a few, I've mentioned this several times before, I am in favor of, well, I, I, will, I will get there, but I, I've talked to some people recently about Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter on the channel. Um, and I just want to say that how I hear Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter is, is very interesting. Starting with All Lives Matter, people who talk about All Lives Matter always talk about the human being, the essence of a person, right? I don't care if you're black, white, gay, straight, 10 feet tall, two feet tall, you know, uh, Hispanic, Italian, Chinese, uh, like, eh, you know, what matters is the, is the person, is the, is the person and what they do, right? That is, that is the essence argument of all lives matter. And what I was just talking about, you know, in terms of we need to provide heart in a structural way, right? We need to bring the humanity back to these institutions that treat us like objects, that alienate us, right? <coughs> which is exactly what Marx talks about in a very different way. He talks about it from an economic point of view. I'm talking about it from more of a, an emotional, psychological point of view. But I have to side with Black Lives Matter here. Um, the why, why? People probably, you know. So yeah, I believe, I believe that the essence of a person is, is, important to understand to be as empathetic and loving as possible to provide as much heart as possible and the community feel as possible people need to try to understand how other people live what is another person's point of view what is life like living in their shoes for a day and what black lives matter is striving to do is provide perspective as to how a black person's existence and a minority's existence, I mean, a black person's existence and way of living and point of view of the world is completely different from a Latinx person, is completely different from a cisgender or transgender person, you know? Each, each intersection that a person belongs to provides a different way of viewing the world and seeing the world. And so if a person, if people really actually care about providing as much heart and community values as possible, they will go the extra step to put themselves into other people's shoes. You know, uh, a white, a white guy from Ohio who is straight who is Christian, who is poor, you know? What is life and their point of view like? How, how, can, how can they understand and see the world differently and learn from a person who is black and poor? You know, maybe that, that intersection of intersectionality of, of, of having not enough money to live is somewhere that where they can build a bridge. But it's important to try to understand, to put yourself in the shoes of a, of a person who is, is black and transgender, you know, who's living in San Diego, you know, place is very important in understanding a point of view, you know? And, and there's so much more to be gained you know, when we learn how other people, the realities of how other people live and how other people see the world, it informs us and it, 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 it enriches our lives too. And it not only allows us to be better allies, and, but, to, but to understand just like how complicated the world really is, how infinitesimately large, how infinitely large and complicated 
this reality is. And we cannot be as good of advocates as possible unless we step into the uncomfortability of putting ourselves in other people's shoes and seeing through their eyes and listening through their eyes. It may not be the most comfortable thing to do. I'm taking this race, gender, and sexuality class, my last class here in grad school. And my thoughts of it are that, you know, we grow up racist. This culture, this society is racist. And I have been indoctrinated with that. I've also been indoctrinated with homophobia in my life. My, I mean, my parents are loving people and, you know, and this is the thing, this is the thing, is that I have, I have black friends, I have gay friends, but I have still grown up in a culture where the standard is racism and homophobia. I, those live in my body. You know, I'm afraid of, of being anything but straight. I'm afraid of, I, you know, I, I, my race can't change, but I'd be afraid to, to become a black person because just of how, how the world would treat me differently. I mean, I would have to, I would have to be so much more aware of cops and, and, you know, insurance companies and, and landlords, you know, um, pricing houses differently for me than, than for a white person, you know, if I were black. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, that's two of like a billion things that happen differently for, for black people than, than for me. And, and f to learn about that and to think about that and be aware of it, to, and, you know, to keep my eyes open and, and aware of that stuff, that is, that by, by incorporating that into just living life, that is the best way to be an advocate and to be a better listener. So, the ultimate goal is community values. The ultimate goal is to become more loving, empathetic, proactively empathetic human beings. What can we do if we're not in power to do that? How can we create better communities while not being in power? And it's first, it's establishing communication, direct communication with the powers that be and calling them to account asking them questions and asking them if they can help first of all you know because people in power are humans too and maybe they're just unaware maybe they're just blind you know they're stuck in their own world but it may just take a human touch a human question an empathetic question to get them to see that maybe they could be doing more you know and so that's something that I care about and that's something that I'm actively doing these days. Um, and I wanted to share all of that with you. Um, I'm also writing uh, a little bit about this too. I would really like to, to publish something soon, um, self-publish or otherwise, just about about bringing people together more, you know. Um, you know, I keep asking other people about their stories, and and I'm I'm writing about mine right now. Um, I really don't like talking about my life, but I like writing about it. So maybe I'll I will put that out there and see you know, if anyone wants to read my read about my story. I used to be a clown. I used to be a fucking clown. I mean, it was great. I was making a lot of money. Um, 
I, uh, I miss it sometimes because it was a very active job and it was very fun. And I was, you know, do magic shows and there were some interesting people. And I mean, that was like, I mean, I did over 1500 birthday parties over the course of five years. And I mean, that was like, that was like a degree in itself doing all that, getting to know people, connecting, you know, love kids, making them smile. It was great. But this is a different time now. And uh, I meant to do other bigger things, you know, bringing this message out. I have no idea who's watching this. And I mean, this, this was a pretty dense, this is a pretty dense video. Um, but it's just my kind of philosophical musings on how to move forward. Um, there are some um, authors that I really care about that I really want to get back to that talk about stuff like this, um, that talk about community values at least. Um, oh, well, first I want to recommend Audrey Lord's um, The Master's Tools Will Not Dismantle the Master's House which is talking about, it's an, it's an essay by Audre Lorde, which I highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend. You know, the same methods, the same mindset will not, will not change or fix the problems that that mindset used to create in the first place. Capitalism, I guess you could call it. Some people say capitalism. Capitalism is a very complicated subject, in my opinion. Um, you know, that's like that's like a three-hour-long uh, summit meeting, and to discuss the positives and negatives of capitalism. I think things can work. Things. I think my my deep theory is that capitalism can work. Socialism can work, but the system needs to be human. These systems would not exist if humans didn't exist. They would just be gone. We created them, so we need to be at the center of the philosophy. Development of human capacity, human development, you know? Human creativity, human capital is what it's called, human capital, development of human capital, freedoms, creativity, dreams, you know, cultivating dreams, putting in the concrete. <sighs> yeah, so anyway, I'm kind of rambling on now, but I, I, this just, this stuff just like, burns me up. I love this stuff. I love this stuff. And uh, I really want to do more with this. I really want to help people. I want to bring justice. I want to cultivate conversation. Ask the tough questions. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my, uh, that is my Destiny. Yeah. Bring the truth to people. You know, ask the hard questions, get people to be uncomfortable. You know, see them as a person, understand them as a person. But then ask them the tough questions to get them uncomfortable. That's where I am in my development right now. I'm, I am uncomfortable asking and being critical and direct with people, you know. Anyway, thank you guys. And I will absolutely, this is like my second, my second reflection in a week, which is a lot, but I was just feeling very um, excited about this topic and I wanted to share it with you. And I hope that I'll be able to come back to this myself and develop my thoughts and feelings on this further. I know I will. I've been writing about it, you know, so. 
Okay, guys. Well, much love and um, and uh, yeah, sending you hugs. Okay. All right. Bye bye.